Hey everyone, welcome to the Industry Show. I'm your host, Nitin Bajaj, and joining me today is Padma Shri, Dr. Vivek Vaproy. Vivek, welcome on the show. Thank you. Pleasure is all ours. So let's start with a big question. Who is Vivek? Who is Vivek? Well, my career has been that of an economist. I have been in academia most of my life, although in the past as well, I have worked for the government. Right now, I'm the chairman of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. Short and sweet. I love the humility. Vivek, tell us what the EAC, the Economic Advisory Council, does. Uh, and I know it will be a challenge to say that in a minute. But we'd love to give a layman like me an understanding of what the mission is, what is the vision, what is the impact of the EAC. Uh, the history of the Economic Advisory Council goes back a long, long time. It started off in the 1970s when the famous economist Shubhmay Chakravarti mm -hmm. was an economic advisor to the Prime Minister. Thereafter, different Prime Ministers have sometimes had an Economic Advisory Council. Mm -hmm. The last Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, also had an economic advisory council which used to be headed by Dr. Rangarajan. Mm -hmm. This particular economic advisory council was established in September 2017 by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Mm -hmm. As the expression economic advisory council to the Prime Minister suggests, it offers advice directly to the Prime Minister. There are other positions which also offer economic advice, including that of the Chief Economic Advisor, who is located in the Department of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance, who primarily offers advice to the Finance Minister. Different ministries have their own economic advisors. This one, it has a structure with three full-time members and the chairman, the other two members are Sanjeev Sanyal and Shamika Ravi. These are the full-time members. There are several part-time members also. And as I said, it's an economic advisory council to the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. What it renders in terms of advice remains with the Prime Minister. It does not come out of it to the public domain. Mm -hmm. And since it is to the Prime Minister, it has to be an important enough issue to be escalated to the level of the Prime Minister. We typically have our meetings once every month. Okay, so only the important stuff. <laughs> Tell us about, you know, as you look at all of these different issues, social, political, economic, what's the one big challenge you face? As the chairman of the Economic yes. Advisory Council to the Panels? Well, let me put it like this, mm -hmm. that I'm an economist. Yeah. I'm an academic. Academics, or I used to be an academic, Academics are very good at writing papers which list out all the problems that exist. This particular Prime Minister is not a Prime Minister who is interested in the problems. He is interested in people telling him how to solve the problems. The classic academic is very bad at doing that. The classic academic is very bad at pinpointing specific bits of action that needs to be done. And of course, when you're rendering advice to someone like the Prime Minister, you're rendering advice to someone who's inherently a politician. So therefore, the message has to be couched in those terms. So the greatest challenge is to translate whatever thoughts you have into a specific action points mm -hmm. and B, express it in slightly non-technical terms. Not to dumb it down, but to express it using slightly different words mm -hmm. from what you would do if you were to be writing a paper. Right. And I believe you've done well. You've been at it for six years. So. Well, I presume so, otherwise <laughs> I would have been kicked out by now. <laughs> On the flip side of challenges come opportunities. What's the one that you're most excited about? As the Economic Advisory Council sure. again? Well, obviously, it is very exciting because you are rendering advice to the Prime Minister.
us. And I repeat what I just said, that our advice is not for the world in general. The world in general does not know. So one of the biggest challenges actually has been that people say, what on earth do you guys do? We don't find you visible. You don't tell the world at large what mm -hmm. you've been up to. One of the things that's very exciting about this particular job is suddenly you see the government has taken action A, B, or C. And even, even if the world does not know that mm -hmm. uh, you have had a role to play in that, that is exhilarating, that you are actually influencing policy. So true. Now, when I asked you both the challenge and the opportunity question, you were very specific in asking me, is, is this as the chairman of the EAC? I'm curious to hear, outside of your role, in the other 11 or 12 hours of your day, what is the biggest challenge and what's the biggest Oh, there are several different <laughs> things I do, actually, other than the Economic Advice yes. Council with the Prime Minister. Uh, strange though it may seem, uh, I write a limerick every day. Yes. So, uh, five days a week, actually, mm -hmm. for a newspaper called Mint. So my biggest challenge, the first thing in the morning, is what am I going to write the limerick on? <laughs> uh, then I off, I write columns for a whole lot of newspapers. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are uh, writing columns regularly, mm -hmm. the biggest challenge is to think of what you are going to write on. Uh, so that's the challenge. Once you figure out what you're going to write on, then it becomes easy. Uh, then there is the regular work at the Economic Advisory Council, which also means as a chairman managing the views of different individuals, because after all, we've got what we've got seven different individuals who all have their different points of view or may have their different points of view. So one needs to reconcile them into a consensus position of the Economic Advisory Council. So managing that is uh, it's not a bit of an issue, but it needs some managing. And then uh, I also do some translations yes. from the Sanskrit to the English. Mm -hmm. uh, so that engages me towards the evening. So different challenges at different points during the day. And by some translation, you mean you've only transcribed the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and a few other things. Right. And you've published what, about 70 odd books? Uh, the number of books I can't give a satisfactory answer <laughs> right now. <laughs> The reason being that at one point they were all listed number-wise. Now they are listed uh, sort of heading-wise, theme-wise. So I don't have a ready count, but authored, edited together, it would be about 130, 140. Oh, wow. You must have more than 24 hours in a day. <laughs> no, not really, because uh, I generally do not bring professional work home. Uh, so the professional stuff is out of the way by about 7 in the evening. Uh, 7 to 8.30 is when I do the translations, so mm -hmm. roughly by 8.30, the working day, so to speak, is over. You're a very disciplined person. It's really a question of time management, yes. because I think uh, what people, uh, people quite often use the buzzword of multitasking. Yes. I do not think anything like multitasking ever exists. Multitasking in the course of a day, I may be seen to be doing six different things. That's not multitasking, because at any one point in time, I'm doing only one. Uh, so serially, it's, it is a different task, but at any one point in time, it's just one thing. The most difficult thing, and people have asked me such questions before, the most difficult thing to do is when I'm doing X to blank out everything else. Uh, that's easier said than done. And people have asked me that how have you cultivated this habit? This is not something that can be easily described. It's just happened over a period of time. But that's the most difficult thing to do. True. I want to go back in time and take a look at the rearview mirror and talk about one instance that blew your expectations and became a success beyond your imagination. And another one that did not. And didn't even meet your expectations, became a failure or a lesson? In my life, you mean? Yes. Um, you see, throughout, uh, I am someone who gets very impatient doing the same kind of thing years on end. So my career has been a bit of a roller coaster ride. 
meaning that after I have been safe and secure in a certain job for a certain period of time, I get bored, I just chuck it and uh, take a leap into the unknown. Mm -hmm. So throughout my career, I have taken risks, mm -hmm. uh, strange kinds of things, all kinds of things. So I would not recommend my life path as a role model for others to follow because it has always been in terms of taking risks. When you take a risk, there is your short term and there is a long term. In the short term, there are consequences. And you think, oh my God, why did I do this? I was perfectly safe and happy doing something else. But in the long run, all the risks have actually paid off. Mm -hmm. So you're a role model. No, I'm not. Because as I said, I think few people would be crazy enough to do things like sure. these. Sure. I think you know, the mindset that I come from, that I've learned, is I'd rather take the risk and come out wrong than live in the regret. I should have. Uh, no, no, I don't have any regrets. Right. I have no regrets. Yes. But let me let me give an example sure. of that. Otherwise, probably it's not very obvious what I'm trying to mm -hmm. say. I had a I headed a law reforms project mm -hmm. from '93 to '98. Before that, I was happily established as a professor of economics of the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, mm -hmm. who would retire at a certain date, get pension, provident fund, gratuity, whatever, whatever. And suddenly I was asked whether I would be willing to help head a law reforms mm -hmm. project. Nothing to do with economics. Right. And I decided to resign my comfortable and cushy job and take up the law reforms project. Now most people thought I was mad and eccentric, which I probably was. Mm -hmm. But I liked doing that law reforms project. So time after time, and this is actually what has happened ever since the start of my career in uh, Kolkata. You're a refined risk taker. I love that. E yes, but it's not that. Uh, it's sort of. It's a calculated risk. It's no, not even a calculated risk. Uh, calculated seems to suggest that you weighed all the pros and the cons and calculated everything. I've never done that. Oh, mm -hmm. fine. This sounds interesting. Let's do. Okay, that. I'm bored with whatever else I'm doing. Let's let me just do that. I love that. I'd love to take this moment and transition into my favorite part of the show. We call that the one line life lessons. We'd love for you to share a few of your life lessons with us. Um, well, firstly, in continuation of what I said yes. earlier, that if you are going to be crazy mm -hmm. in terms of the way I've described it, you need to marry wisely. So one life lesson is be, sh be careful about choosing your spouse, especially if you're going to be crazy in this fashion. The other life lesson is, as I said, it's worked out for me, taking risks has worked out for me. That does not necessarily mean it's going to work out for everyone. And the third one, which is again linked, is the cliched one, that every time a door or a window seems to close, some other door or some window seems to open. And I have now come to the conviction that no matter how well you want to chart out your life, plan out your life, it never really works that way. Over and above that, you can call it destiny, you can give it something else. There is something that destiny has in mind for, for you and that's completely immune to whatever your own planning process might tend to suggest and therefore life has its own way of taking you along and therefore just enjoy the ride. Love that. Dr. Debroy, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate you taking the time, sharing your journey your story and your life lessons with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you.